The United College Distinguished Visiting Scholar Scheme is made possible by the generous support of the college's endowment fund. Under this scheme, United College is able to invite world-renowned scholars to Hong Kong to give public lectures and meet staff and students from the college and the university. This year, United College has much privilege to have invited Professor David Geary from the University of Missouri as our distinguished visiting scholar in 2014 to 15. Without further ado, I would like to turn the floor to the moderator of today's lecture, Professor Chan Ping-Shing from the Department of Statistics of the Chinese University of Hong Kong to introduce Professor Geary and the topic of this afternoon. Professor Chan, please. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to introduce you to today's speaker, Professor Gary. Uh, he's the uh, from of uh, University of Missouri. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time, so uh, uh, he's going to like share with us the, on his work on early predictor of mathematics, uh, mathematics achievement and achievement growth. Please join me to welcome Professor Gary. All right, thank you um, for the uh, invitation. It's a great honor uh, to be here today and to be part of the uh, Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. Um, as was stated, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the development of mathematical competencies in kids and the predictors of these. Uh, these are grants funded by the uh, U.S. National Institutes of Health and uh, the U.S. National uh, Science Foundation. Uh, as I said, I'll give you an overview of our longitudinal, so following kids um, over time, uh, study. I'm going to uh, illustrate um, some of our findings by um, showing you how we've identified the first grade numerical knowledge that predicts um, performance on measures of functional numeracy, uh, which I'll define here in a bit, um, in seventh grade. Uh, we have a second component to the study, which is a preschool, or you would call it a kindergarten study, uh, which I'll, I'll tell you about. And we'll talk about, or I'll talk about, the early predictors of um, young kids' uh, mathematics achievement. And then I want to talk a little bit about, go at a little kind of more basic level, and talk about how inherent or evolved or biological number systems contribute to children's learning of symbolic mathematical knowledge. So evolved systems would be human universals, and the symbolic knowledge would be knowledge that is um, school taught. So you only acquire it if you uh, go to school. Our ultimate goal with these studies is to identify the preschool or the K-1 predictors of mathematical competence in high school, uh, in high school algebra uh, in particular. So the first component of this study went from kindergarten, so that would be K-3 for Hong Kong, all the way through ninth grade. So we followed these children um, anywhere from 280 or so to 180, 200 for uh, 10 years. So we assessed them two to three times a year for 10 years. Uh, the yellow um, <clears throat> parts are where we've done assessments. So we gave math and reading achievement in kindergarten and all the way through ninth grade, math cognition tests, same thing, and so forth. Um, 
And the uh, X's are just uh, data that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm just talking about a subset of uh, our data. We have a second component of the uh, study, which is uh, three years old or K1, K2, K3, and first grade component. Um, again, the yellow is uh, data that we have uh, collected. We have multiple cohorts here. Um, the blue is data that we're collecting right now. And the X's are just data that I'm going to talk about uh, today. If you look at the first grade blue here and the first grade here, the assessments will be identical. So when we get this data, we will see what predicts performance here. And then by knowing what predicts performance here, we'll be able to look at what predicts performance all the way out through ninth grade by overlapping uh, the two studies. <clears throat> My um, focus today will be on 180 kids who took our functional numeracy test, and, and, and again, I'll define that here in a minute, in seventh grade, so in the middle of seventh grade, and they had near complete data on the rest of the um, tasks that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the sample was pretty average in terms of IQ, uh, math achievement at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study, about half were girls, about three quarters were white. Um, they started the study when they were six years old, so K3, uh, and this assessment was um, in seventh grade, although we have data on them all the way through the end, end of ninth grade, but I actually haven't had a chance to uh, analyze that data yet. Now, some of the measures we gave in first grade and fifth grade, we gave uh, hour-long um, working memory assessments. So we looked at their um, skills, their ability to remember uh, phonological or sounds, uh, visual-spatial short-term memory, as well as executive functioning, the ability to kind of do one th thing while keeping something else uh, in mind, very standard uh, procedures there. We, we have a mobile testing van that actually goes to their house to uh, test them on that. Rapid autom automatic naming, so how quickly you can enunciate number words and letters. It actually predicts some early skills. Um, we gave two intelligence measures, a nonverbal test in kindergarten, the Ravens, progressive matrices, if you're familiar with these, and then a standardized Wexler uh, measure. Uh, in second, third, and fourth grade, we asked all of their teachers to rate their in-class behavior, their attention, their organization, and so forth um, in, in their classrooms. And then we gave a variety of uh, math tasks, depending on the grade they're in. Uh, so early on, we focused on number and counting. Uh, as they got older, we moved to fractions. And then in ninth grade, we gave it a number of uh, tasks looking at um, algebraic cognition and algebraic skills, but I'm not going to talk about the latter ones uh, today. And then the, num the numeracy tests I'm going to talk about are paper and pencil tests of word problems and other types of problems that I'll elaborate uh, in a second. But turning first to the uh, number tasks, uh, the first task um, is, we call this the number sets test, and we developed this test ourselves uh, for this particular study. And just to get an idea of how kids are able to associate numerals with the quantities they represent, either collections of objects here or collections of other numerals. And we also have uh, measures that would be like uh, two things here and the Arabic numeral one, so they would circle this. They just get like a minute to go through it, and they just circle the threes, skip over that, skip over that, circle that, circle that. Um, and it just kind of gives us uh, an estimate of how good they are at representing magnitudes with actual nu numerals and, and putting uh, those uh, together. We, we use a certain type of statistical technique to kind of get uh, an estimate of how good they are at that. Um, <clears throat> anybody learning mathematics has to understand uh, the mathematical number line, of course. And so one of the other tasks we gave was uh, uh, a number line task. And we, we just had them, gave them a number, and they placed where it would go on the number line. Then we just looked how accurate uh, they were uh, with that. 
uh, all of the kids in first, they, these are all first grade tasks. Um, all of the kids in first grade were also given um, uh, addition problems to solve, and they were given a series of problems. And for each and every problem, we kind of figured out based on reaction times, observations, and their descriptions of how they solved the problem. So five plus four, if they counted on their fingers, we counted that as one thing. If they said they just knew the answer, uh, we call that retrieval, so forth. And they were also given some more complex problems. Uh, the measures of interest here are how many basic facts they could retrieve from memory. <clears throat> Probably an easy task for first graders in Hong Kong, but not so easy for kids in the U.S. Um, but in any case, so 5 plus 4 equals 9. If they knew that, then it was correct retrieval. Um, decomposition is a much more sophisticated task. So if they had this problem, they could count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 17, all the way to 23, or they could start counting from 17 and count to 23, or they could take the 6, decompose it into two threes, and then add them successively. 17 is 3 is 20, plus um, 3 more is 23, of course. Um, that's a much more sophisticated strategy and is dependent on a conceptual understanding of um, cardinal value and, and understanding of num numbers and numerals. And then the frequency and accuracy of min counting, and that again is starting from 17 and counting the minimum or smallest number, or starting from 5 and counting 6, 7, 8, 9. So how frequently they did all of these things correctly we used as um, outcome measure or as predictor measures. So in first grade, we had, we focused on six um, numerical tasks, the counting tasks, um, how many facts they could retrieve, use of decomposition, number line performance, and then number sets fluency. Um, I took that data and did a factor analysis, basically separating it out into two components, um, their skill at using counting to solve arithmetic problems, and then their knowledge of um, the number system. So what numerals represent and their fluency at kind of figuring out the relations um, between them. And that became, these two were then used to try to predict performance on the numeracy measures um, in seventh grade, so more than six years uh, later. Now, functional numeracy is um, tests that have been used by labor economists and others to predict uh, your employment prospects. So if you don't go to college, you know, a lot of people obviously don't go to college. College mathematics is one thing, and then general mathematics for people who don't go to college is something else. And that something else you can call functional numeracy. So what I was interested in here was um, kids' or adolescents' development of these job-relevant uh, mathematical skills and what would predict those early on uh, in their career. Now, it's going to be less of a problem uh, for Hong Kong, for example, or China, but it still will, will be a bit of a problem, and, and, it's, and it's a big problem in the U.S. and, and in parts of Europe, where many adults are not, do not have enough mathematical skills for a lot of kind of blue-collar or kind of low-level jobs. So the economy is changing such that lower-level jobs require more and more math knowledge than it did previously, and understanding things like interest, if you're going to buy a car on, on payments or invest money in a bank account, how much uh, that will uh, accrue over time and so forth, um, you need a certain amount of uh, mathematical skills. Um, studies that have looked at the personal and social costs of innumeracy versus illiteracy find that innumeracy has higher costs than illiteracy or poor reading skills because at least in um, a lot of uh, Western cultures, uh, innumeracy is just much more common because it's not seen as that big of a problem. So I reviewed um, labor economic studies of math predictors of employability, wages, on-the-job productivity, the ability to um, uh, go into on-the-job training programs to move up into management or whatever 
Um, and the studies are very consistent in what it takes to um, do well in these non-college related uh, skills, uh, jobs. Um, and, and, and basically, if you can solve multi-step word problems, so it involves translating two parts of the, of the word problem into two equations um, that require computational whole number and fraction arithmetic, simple algebra, a little bit of geometry and uh, measurement, uh, you know, if you, you do okay on those, you're probably going to do okay in a lot of these blue collar uh, positions. But not everybody um, masters these skills. So just uh, real quickly, uh, some of the numeracy measures we use from the Educational Testing Service. If you're, if you're familiar with the SAT or the GRE or the graduate management exam and so forth, um, they also uh, produce uh, other types of tests and we use those for, to assess our word problems. Computational whole number arithmetic. So how many problems can you solve uh, of the, this type correctly in one minute? That's just kind of how fluent you are um, in that. Similar type of thing uh, based only on fractions though. Uh, and then finally, uh, we developed another test uh, which we call the fractions comparison test based on how kids um, solve fractions problems and the, the types of errors they make when they solve those problems. And it's a simple test. All they do, all, we have to keep all of our tests uh, short and sweet because we test all the kids in the schools. Um, they just see pairs of fractions and they have to circle the larger one, the one with the highest magnitude. Um, in this type of uh, problem, uh, the numerator, the one is the same, the denominator differs. So it assesses their understanding of the inverse relation between the value of the denominator and the quantity represented by the fraction. So kids that don't understand this relation will circle one-ninth. Kids who understand the relation will circle one-fifth. And so we had a, a number of different types of uh, problems and manipulations of, of this type, which gave us a, you know, a good estimate of their conceptual understanding of uh, fractions. Uh, again, did a fra factor analysis on all of these, and they all come together in one kind of functional numeracy factor. And so I standardized those scores and, and basically made one score based on performance on all of these measures. So that was the score that they got when they were 13 years old. Um, and we wanted to predict what predicts their 13-year performance on this numeracy measure. And this is the same type of skills that will predict their ability to do well in non-college jobs when they hit 18 or 17, whenever they enter uh, the workforce. Um, we also had a lot of other information on these kids which we used as um, statistical covariates, the school site, when, where they uh, started uh, the study, sex, race, um, uh, math and reading achievement when they started uh, the project, seventh grade concurrent math achievement and so forth, IQ, all the working memory measures in first and fifth grade and then the in-class um, uh, attention uh, skills. So all of the types of things that could be a confound between our early first grade measures and our outcome measure, uh, we tried to include as statistical covariates to make sure it wasn't biasing our results. Just as a um, uh, <coughs> uh, kind of a, a, a very basic results, the functional numeracy measure was pretty highly correlated with number systems knowledge. And remember, this was assessed six years before they took this test. So even with a six-year gap, um, it is correlated. It explains almost 50% of the variance uh, in functional numeracy. Counting competence wasn't as strongly correlated. Uh, the important finding, though, is once we control for all of these other factors, uh, the highlighted things are things that are correlated with functional numeracy. So Asian kids a little bit better on the numeracy test than the white kids. Uh, seventh grade math achievement was correlated and so forth. But even when we control for all of these sorts of things, number system knowledge remained a highly significant predictor 
of uh, numeracy skills um, six, six and a half years uh, later. So the types of knowledge that kids start school with, uh, types of number knowledge kids start school with at the beginning of first grade sets them on a trajectory um, for developing employment relevant skills uh, that is measurable um, you know, more than six years later and I'm sure even uh, longer than that. Um, we did another type of analysis as well, what's called the step rise uh, logistic regression. So we just said, okay, these kids are numerate. They have the basic uh, number and arithmetic skills that they need to do well in a job. And these other kids are innumerate, so it's either you're, you're numerate or you're not numerate. And we use the same exact predictors as in the previous analysis. And two things came out. Um, basically, what this means is that for the number system knowledge, if you start first grade in a standard deviation below average, or say at the 15th, the 20th percentile, around there in the bottom uh, part uh, of first graders, then the likelihood that you're going to be enumerate in, uh, as an adolescence is four times higher than uh, kids that are just average in uh, number knowledge. Um, and in-class attentive behavior turned out to be very important um, as well. Now it turns out that number system knowledge is actually malleable or changeable. So what I'm showing you here on the x-axis is the maximum kind of the percentage. So if you got 100% on all of the tests we gave, um, then it would be at 100, and, and none, none of the kids did that well. Um, and th this is how far they are from uh, the maximum or, or their percentage overall score in first through fifth grade. The high numeracy kids are the kids in the top quartile in seventh grade performance. The middle, uh, the average are the um, uh, second and third quartiles, and the low numeracy is the bottom quartile. So the, the kids that are really at risk for long-term uh, problems in adulthood. We can see here that um, you know, the low numeracy kids, of course, start low, um, and the gap widens during the first year of primary school. But from second grade to fifth grade, the rate of improvement is actually the same as the other groups. So basically what that means is that the early number knowledge deficits of these kids are there at the beginning of first grade and increase over the course of the first year of schooling, but they're fine after that. But, <clears throat> but they never make up that, they never make up this deficit. Meaning that if you're going to intervene, you really have to intervene either before this or during first grade. Otherwise, uh, there's very likely to be long-term uh, problems. <clears throat> so the next question is, okay, we know you start first grade um, <coughs> with some number deficits. If you start with number deficits, that predicts long-term problems. That means we have to go earlier than first grade to understand where those early deficits came from. And that's where this second uh, K-1 to uh, first grade uh, study um, comes in. And ultimately, we want to predict K-1, uh, figure out the K-1 knowledge that predicts first grade number system knowledge. And then once we know that, then we can know, okay, with three-year-olds, what do three-year-olds need to know to put them on the trajectory for uh, the number system uh, knowledge in first grade. But we, I don't have that data yet. We're still collecting it. But I can talk about some other aspects of that study that are um, interesting and important. Um, and the first question we addressed with, with that study is the relation between the inherent approximate number system, which I'll, I'll talk about here in just a second, 
and mathematics achievement and whether that is mediated by kids' early learning of symbolic knowledge or their early learning of numerals and number words. Now, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of different uh, analyses here. Um, we're running, in this particular study, we're running three different cohorts. So we have about 80 kids um, each in three years, and we're following all of those different cohorts for four years uh, each. And so the analyses I'll talk about will include anywhere from 138 to 198 um, small kids. Title I is a U.S. federally funded program for kids who are at risk for academic failure. So they're a good, good sample for us uh, to use. Um, uh, for this group, uh, IQ is average. Now, we threw out a, a number of kids who had very low IQs, and so if we would have included them, it would have been low average IQ. But for the analysis I'm going to talk about, it's average intelligence. Math achievement is low average, about half are girls, a little over half are white, but, but they're generally very, very low income. So they're kind of from poorer families and therefore at risk for um, problems. Uh, they started when they were three years, nine months of age. We assessed them six times a year for the first two years, three times uh, in kindergarten, K-3, and then uh, a couple times in first grade, which we're currently doing uh, now. But I'm only going to talk about the, uh, the K-1 uh, results. So, and we assess their quantitative development at the beginning of the school year um, and at the end of the school year. So beginning of K-1 and end of K-1. Uh, we have 12 quantitative tasks that assess a number of different things. Um, I'm just going to focus on a couple of those. The first is, as I said, the approximate number system. So this is an evolved system. It's a biologically based system that's evident in um, every species that I'm aware of that has been studied. It's evident in infants, even in the first day of life. Infants have a sensitivity to the relative quantities of um, collections of objects. So if we presented this for two seconds to a, third, uh, to a three or four-year-old and asked them, are there more yellow dots or more blue dots, it's too fast for them to count. A lot of them can't count yet anyway. Um, and they could tell you there's more blue dots than yellow dots. So they have this way of determining relative magnitude and the underlying system is represented in part of the parietal cortex is called the approximate number system. Now people also have the ability uh, to represent quantity using what's called the object tracking system. This is part of the visual system and involves for keeping track of where objects are. So if you're watching my hand here and it's moving in this trajectory, it goes behind uh, the uh, laptop monitor here and then comes out here, when, once it disappears, you know it still exists, right? At least I hope it still exists and it comes out here. You understand that. So th there's a built-in system for um, doing that, for keeping track of objects. And for young kids, the limits of the system are three items. So some people have proposed that um, young kids and even infants can use this system to quantify one, two, or three things. So we have two potential systems involved in the early learning of relative uh, or exact uh, magnitude. So we have measures of both the ANS and the OTS in the study. We also have a number of measures of um, symbolic knowledge, numeral identification, so you see the Arabic numeral one or two or three or whatever, do they, can they name it? Um, do they know which is more, five or three in this case, for example? Um, counting, and that's just counting one, two, three, four, five. How far up can they count? And cardinal knowledge, uh, which is very important. And that's knowing that um, this numeral five represents or stands for a collection of five things. The numeral two or the number word two is a represent, uh, represents symbolic representation of two things. Now, of the, um, all of the quantitative tasks we gave, it turns out that a combination of this four um, predict mathematics achievement at the end of preschool. So kids who know their uh, numerals, know which is bigger or smaller, and um, 
kind of understand cardinal knowledge, do well um, by the end of their first year of uh, preschool. The question here is, does, or our first question is, does this inherent or biological approximate number system um, contribute to kids' early learning of symbolic um, mathematics? So do we have a built-in kind of uh, foothold that allows kids to begin to learn uh, formal, culturally specific mathematics? Um, so to test this, um, I took a composite of the ANS, just their accuracy on the task, and then a mathematical function called the Weber fraction, which kind of just gives a, a different way of estimating how sensitive kids are to relative differences. So some kids can tell the difference between five things and six things presented very quickly together. They'll know that six is more. Other kids, the difference has to be like three and six. So it has to be much bigger for them to tell. And the Weber fraction gives you a, an estimate of how sensitive they are. Uh, use a certain type of statistical technique to look at basically uh, changes uh, in performance on the symbolic tasks as related to ANS. So, so the question is, are kids who are very sensitive to um, differences in collections of items as assessed by the approximate number system, do these kids learn number words, numerals, cardinal value, and other things more quickly across the school year, so from the, t from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year when we gave these tasks, do they learn them more quickly than do other kids? Um, and it turns out they do. So this is a, a kind of a busy slide. The, the, the only thing uh, that's important here uh, is down here. So again, we had a lot of um, uh, covariates, time one and time two. So we looked at changes in verbal counting so at the end of the school year, the average kid could count 1, 2, 3, all the way to 13. The beginning of the year, they could count to 13 minus 2.8, so they can count to about 10 or so, 1, 2, 10. Uh, and we controlled for age, boys versus girls, parental education, intelligence, executive control, letter identification. But what's important here is that kids who had a good ANS, that is they were very sensitive to relative magnitude, uh, learned to count more quickly than other kids. They learned uh, their numerals more quickly than other kids. They learned the differences between numerals, three and five, more quickly than other kids. And they learned cardinal value of numerals and number words more quickly than other kids. So this biological system that's evident at birth seems to contribute to kids how easy it is for kids to begin to learn formal uh, mathematical uh, knowledge, formal mathematical symbols. <clears throat> now, a number of people have been saying that, well, the ANS becomes very important kind of foundation for mathematics achievement. And they found this relation. The better the ANS, the better people um, adults and kids and other folks do in a variety of mathematics tasks. Um, and we found, we found the same thing. It basically, it's, it's highly significant. The more uh, sensitive this is, the better you do on math tests. But we also wondered if, well, maybe the contribution of the ANS is really uh, indirect. That is, it is more dependent on early symbolic learning than on the ANS directly. So what this shows, the ANS uh, influences your learning of verbal counting, cardinal knowledge, and so forth. E everything that I just showed you, this is a different way of analyzing it, just repeats it, of course. And then this shows that verbal counting, cardinal knowledge, numeral recognition, all of this contribute to mathematics achievement. It turns out that cardinal knowledge is especially important. And once we control for this sim early symbolic knowledge, this relation between the ANS and math achievement is no longer significant. Basically, what that means is that this early inherent system for representing quantity influences kids' early acquisition of basic symbols and particularly important cardinal knowledge, as we'll talk about, 
But once they understand that, the ANS is no longer important. So once you get into the symbols and the meaning of mathematical symbols, it's a different system than uh, this inherent system. Something else takes over um, and contributes to math learning. Uh, this next slide is just essentially showing the same thing but using the waiver fraction rather than percent correct so we don't need to worry about that. It, it basically just replicates the um, effect. <clears throat> now it turns out that um, some other analyses indicate that understanding the cardinal meaning of number words, understanding that a three, and I'm, I'm sure it works for Arabic numerals as well, understanding not only you know, learning the number words, one, two, three, four, five, or recognizing the numerals, but what's really important is understanding what they mean, the quantities they represent. Seems like a very, very simple thing for us, but it turns out that only people can do it. So there's been a lot of studies of, uh, of primates, uh, chimpanzees, for example, and you can teach them to represent that an Arabic numeral one stands for one thing, an Arabic numeral two stands for two things, three, three things, and so forth. But you have to give them thousands of trials for them to learn that. And you have to teach them every number um, independently. So they never generalize beyond, even if they know the sequence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you've never trained them specifically what a ten stands for in terms of amount, they, they, never, they won't get it, even if they know one through nine. But kids, once they learn one, two, three, they learn one, two, and three pretty much the same way that chimpanzees do. Um, but once they get to four or so, they have this conceptual insight. And then they really understand cardinal knowledge, uh, the cardinal value. It turns out this one measure explains 50% of the math achievement at the end of the first year of preschool. So it's, it's of everything we've talked about is the most critical. Um, question here is how do the ANS and the OTS contribute to the early learning of um, uh, cardinal knowledge? Kind of what is important uh, for that initial insight? Uh, the OTS has an advantage in that it's perfectly accurate. One, two, and three, um, it, it's perfectly good. You're not going to confuse two and three. The approximate number system, or the ANS, just gives approximate rep representations of one versus two. So sometimes kids, particularly young kids, will get confused. Uh, they won't, they'll see two things and three things, and they, they won't be 100% accurate in discriminating uh, them. So in um, a study we have uh, uh, under review right now, um, we looked at um, a number of different theories on, on this, whether early learning of cardinal knowledge is only related to the um, approximate number system, in which case performance on the ANS task should correlate with performance on the cardinal knowledge task, the beginning of school, at the end of school, and whether they CP knowers, whether they've made this conceptual insight and generalization um, uh, for all of the number of words they know, or it could be only the OTS is important, or it could be that um, both contribute, the ANS and the OTS contribute. Maybe they are important, you know, at least for, for K-1 kids, uh, for everything here at the beginning and at the end of uh, the first year. Or maybe um, the OTS is important early on when kids are learning the first few number words, one, two, and three in particular. Um, but once they learn those, maybe it's only the approximate number system that is critical for them making this generalization uh, to all of the number words that they know. And there, there's reasons to believe that, that this is true because people have argued that the approximate number system has a built-in kind of um, way of estimating uh, cardinal value, at least general cardinal value. 
Uh, so the outcome measures for the analyses I'm going to show you here are um, the number of words they understood from one to six. So, so we gave a very standardized task for that. We asked kids to give a, a puppet one cookie or two cookies or three cookies or four or whatever, and how accurate they were on that um, determined their, uh, their kind of cardinal knowledge there. So they could, they could go from zero to six on that score. Uh, and then we also looked at um, what are called CP knowers or cardinal principle knowers or not. So once kids get to four or so, they typically understand everything. So if they understand four or five or that, then they're going to understand seven and eight and nine and ten. They're going to understand what all of that means without having to teach them each and every uh, thing. So in this first, oops. <clears throat> so at the beginning of um, preschool, the beginning of K-1, um, both the OTS and the ANS predict performance on this cardinal knowledge task, suggesting the dual mechanism uh, approach is important. So even when we control for all of these other things, they're both still significant and both, both about the same uh, magnitude. So early learning of cardinal knowledge, you can use the OTS, you can use the ANS, or you can use them both. Um, but once you get beyond the initial learning, the beginning of uh, K-1, by the end of K-1, only the ANS is important and the OTS is no longer significant. So their ability to visually track objects and keep track of how many objects they're watching in a visual scene ha has no influence on their cardinal learning uh, at the end of the year, but it does early on. <clears throat> now we had a number of, we had a, this is a study where we had 198 kids um, in it. And so some of the kids at time one uh, didn't understand the cardinal principle. So they were kind of uh, non-knowers. Um, but some of those kids shifted from non-knowers, not understanding card cardinality symbolically, to understanding it symbolically. So they shifted over time. And um, what we're interested in is what predicted this shift from non-knower to knower. And it turns out that the ANS, uh, kids that were one standard deviation, so at about the 80th percentile or so, uh, on the ANS measures at the beginning of K1, were six and a half times more likely to become cardinal knowers six months later than were kids who were just average on the ANS. And uh, the OTS in this analysis was not uh, significant. So the ANS um, really seems to be uh, important for the uh, early development of uh, cardinal knowledge. Am I doing okay on time? Um, but but and, and the, the OTS is important very, very early on, uh, but then it drops out in significance. All right, one last uh, result is once kids, I, I said previously that once you begin to understand mathematical symbols, then the ANS drops out. But then the question is, you know, why is cardinal knowledge so important? How does it contribute to other aspects of mathematical uh, learning? And uh, we're just starting uh, to work on that. Um, and the one question we're, we're working on now is whether the OTS uh, is um, the understanding of zero. Zero, zero, or mathematically, it would be the empty set. If you, if you know anything about the history of mathematics, um, uh, learning the, the development of zero or the empty set kind of came much later than other aspects of mathematics. So it's not something that uh, comes easily, although it doesn't seem like a big deal to us. But what's important is neither the OTS nor the ANS have any way of mentally representing zero. Uh, they're, they're just not built um, that way. <clears throat> and so three-year-olds uh, and younger kids, if you just give them a simple task, you have a teddy bear in one area and then you move another one in there, they will uh, implicitly see this as a quantitative task or as an addition task. Um, so they kind of implicitly know 
quantities are important here, not the teddy bear part of it. Um, but if you start with nothing, the empty set, and you move a bear into there, they don't implicitly uh, see it as a quantitative task. So they don't, they know that one plus one equals two, but they don't know that nothing plus one equals one. They're just seeing it as an object moving from one place to another. It's not a quantitative task. <clears throat> and so what we did uh, here was we looked at um, kids' cardinality levels, whether they scored one, two, or all the way up to six on uh, this particular task. And then we looked at their performance on um, a task that involved um, dealing with uh, uh, the addition or subtraction of small quantities within the OTS range. As I said, one thing, adding one more in there, or an empty set, adding one thing out, or having two things, subtracting one thing. Um, and, and what's important, well, a couple of things are important. Even kids who don't have much understanding of cardinality, they did very poorly on the task. They didn't know what one was. They couldn't give one thing or two things uh, to uh, uh, the puppet. But they still implicitly understood that one plus one was two, meaning that they, they understood if you had one thing, you had another thing in there, and then you show them a result of one, they understand that that's wrong. That doesn't make any sense. So they don't they explicitly add, but they, they kind of intuitively know that that's there. And then same with 2 minus 1, so forth. But if you look at the zero problems, which are th this line right here, they don't get it. They, they treat these as something different than the other quantitative, um, than the other simple arithmetic tasks. But it turns out once they become cardinal knowers, I mean, put four and five together because there weren't very many fives. If they get four, they almost always get five. And a few kids made a few mistakes here and the rest got six. So if they were um, cardinal knowers, then they um, actually understood it. They understood that the empty set and adding something into it is a quantitative task. So once you understand um, the cardinal principle, you can begin to pick up on other um, mathematical concepts. Uh, in this case, the zero, oops, uh, in this case, the zero or the empty set um, that has no, um, <clears throat> that they would have no way of knowing based on these very basic prim primitive biological um, systems. So th this is kind of where we're, we're looking at now, the importance of cardinality for learning other symbolic areas of uh, mathematics. So I think I'm getting close to being uh, out of time. Just as a summary, um, by 13 years of age, at least in the US, um, there's a lot of variation in the quantitative uh, tests or quantitative skills that predicts um, their ability to get a decent job, not a college educated job, but a, a, a blue collar kind of low level um, job. And then they're in the wages that they're going to make, their ability to move up, their productivity on the job, and so forth. Beginning of first grade knowledge of the relations among numerals and how quickly and accurately you can process those relations will actually predict um, performance on these numeracy measures more than six years later, controlling for lots of other factors. So it kind of having this early basic number knowledge puts them on a trajectory that is going to make a big difference uh, for the rest of their life in terms of their employment uh, opportunities and, and in terms of their just understanding a lot of day-to-day -day, um, things. Similarly, four-year-olds or three years, nine-month-old Kids, uh, math achievement is predicted by their knowledge of number words, Arabic numerals, and most importantly, their understanding of the cardinal meaning of these number words and numerals. So just num memorizing one, two, three, four, five, and so forth isn't that important, although you have to do it. Understanding what each of those things means um, is very critical to their early achievement. Taking that finding and going a little bit deeper, um, we show that kids use both the object tracking system, a basic uh, visual uh, part of the visual system, 
uh, and the approximate number system to begin to try to understand arbitrary symbols, Arabic numerals or number words, you know, without any meaning, they're just sounds or, or marks on a paper, they mean nothing uh, and are unimportant until they have quantitative meaning. And so they take these very basic biological systems and begin to make inferences and learn um, what these um, symbols mean and that gives us um, cardinal knowledge. <clears throat> That cardinality, understanding of cardinality in turn, seems to be critical for learning other aspects of uh, symbolic mathematics, um, as illustrated, as I just illustrated, um, in beginning to at least implicitly understand that an empty set can have a quantitative uh, meaning. Now, our prediction is that the K1 um, cardinal knowledge is going to uh, be a strong predictor of number system knowledge in first grade, which in turn we already know is a strong predictor of the numeracy stuff. And we have um, a lot of data on their algebraic skills in ninth grade, so we'll look at first grade predictors of those skills. Um, I just haven't had a chance to analyze those yet. Um, so we think that if this turns out to be the case, then cardinal knowledge and, and making sure that K1 kids really understand that is going to be very, very critical in terms of putting them on a trajectory uh, to do well at the beginning of first grade, which then puts them on a trajectory to do well in other areas of mathematics. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Geary, for the interesting and enlightening talk. Please be seated on the stage. I'm sure there will be some questions on the floor. May I now call upon Professor Chan, moderator of today's lecture, to come up to the stage and host the question and answer section for us. Professor Chan, please. <clears throat> Hello. Okay. Professor Gary, thank you for the stimulating talk. And I think Professor Gary is uh, happy to answer questions from the floor. So please put up your hand if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, I've read somewhere that it has been suggested the, uh, that we intrinsically have a more uh, logarithmic perception of the world in terms of uh, mathematics than numerical. So uh, uh, I believe that would be contributed by the ANS. Uh, and what do you think uh, that would mean for uh, early math education, and do you think that will be important in terms of uh, mathematics uh, capability over a long time, uh, in addition to only the uh, numerical part, which seems to uh, be more determinant of, uh, to be more uh, determined by math education later on than just intrinsic uh, uh, ability? Right, right. That, that's a great question. So. Um, there's a lot of research, uh, brain imaging research, and research with other um, species and stuff looking at the basic physiological and neurological properties of the approximate number system. And we know where it's at in the brain, and we know a bit about how it functions. And so some aspects of the functioning of this system can be explained by logarithmic models rather than kind of a linear type of model. There, there's a lot of debate about how that works. But, but that's a little bit different than saying we understand mathematics logarithmically. It's more about the properties of this 
the way this part of the brain works and the way a lot of the parts of the brain work. Um, but the operation of those, even though we can represent it logarithmic, logarithmically, um, gives us just this number sense, which is more the five blue ones or the six um, yellow ones. Um, and, and, and so it's very different than understanding uh, mathematical uh, logarithms, which are very difficult for, for people to understand. But what, what our re research suggests is that whatever is underlying how the ANS operates, um, it is only important for kids' early symbolic learning. And once they begin to understand um, uh, mathematical symbols, cardinality, uh, the meaning of number words, and so forth, um, then kids learning of mathematics is probably not going to be as um, dependent on the functioning of the ANS, however it's functioning, logarithmically or otherwise, than other skills like good math education or just understanding some the relationships uh, between mathematical symbols and um, other aspects of formal mathematics. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello. I, I'm wondering if you can uh, comment on the uh, uh, the finding that Ch uh, Asian children, uh, Chinese uh, mm -hmm. uh, Asians, outperform uh, uh, Western children um, mm -hmm. on all the tests like PISA. And I think you also yeah. did some uh, uh, mm -hmm. research on the cross-cultural comparison. Right. So, I, so my question is: so, so that is uh, at least in the in the last many years, uh, that mm -hmm. seems to be a uh, 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 a fact, then, mm -hmm. and how do you explain this difference? Is that, does the difference come early on in the ANS uh, stage of mm -hmm. the numeracy kind of uh, uh, competence or more this you can call innate evolution related mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. differences or mm -hmm. is it because of uh, later schooling mm -hmm. that uh, the Asian uh, classrooms that produced uh, a better uh, mathematics achievement. Yeah, so. that, uh, that's a great question. So is the East Asian advantage in mathematics, which, which um, probably all of you are familiar with, the East Asians, China, Japan, uh, Korea, do very well in formal mathematics um, relative to kids in the United States and in much of what Western Europe, with, with a few exceptions uh, there. So that's formal mathematics. Is that due to instructional sorts of things, or is there an ANS difference? Um, probably, I, I think it's mostly due to instructional sorts of things. So in the 1990s, um, I actually collaborated with um, a psychologist from um, the Chinese Academy of Sciences doing some work, uh, you know, cross-national work on basic arithmetic skills and, and some of the numeracy stuff that we talked about today. One of the studies we did was cross-generational. So we looked at 12th graders, at 6th graders, and then we looked at older adults. Um, and I chose the age range for the older adults in the U.S. based on when um, it's estimated um, the mathematical education of U.S. students was better than it is now. And what we found was in the older samples, there was no difference between Chinese adults and American adults. But as we moved to the younger groups, the Chinese sample was getting better and the American was getting worse. So it looks like um, the, the gap that we see now is probably fairly recent. Recent being over the last 50 or 60, 70 years or so. So I don't think it has anything to do with inherent differences. I think the educational system for mathematics is just much better in East Asia than in the U.S. Another question is, when you look at uh, all the data, you didn't uh, 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 separate uh, by gender, boys versus girls. Mm -hmm. And then we know there is uh, you know, sex differences, there probably mm -hmm. there are. 
And then the question again is, uh, uh, we, it, uh, more ANS uh, kind of difference or later schooling, but then we, we, we know in, in terms of the, the cultural part, the, uh, the schooling is in fact better fitted when we talk about sex differences to the, uh, you know, the, to, to the female yeah. uh, uh, characteristics. <clears throat> and yeah. then, then how do you explain Mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially in the higher level mathematic achievement, right. uh, potential gender differences. There. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, that's a great great question. There there doesn't seem to be any gender differences in the ANS. So boys and girls are the same, and, and it's a very common. E even guppies have an ANS like system. It's a very very basic, evolutionarily old um, system. On the task that I showed you here, um, there there aren't many gender differences. Um, the one difference that we found was for the word problems. The multi-step word problems, boys generally do better than girls. Um, and that's true in China as well as uh, in the U.S. We've, we've studied that as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's because boys, when you have a mathematical sentence, you have to translate it into an equation. You got another sentence, you have to translate it into an equation, and then you got to figure out the relation between them. Boys are much more likely to diagram the relations in the, words, in, the, in the word problem than are girls. And if you diagram those relations, you're much less likely to make translation errors or make, uh, make mistakes in trying to figure out the relation between them. So I think the difference there has to do with visual spatial abilities, not the ANS. Um, okay. Hi, um, I'm, uh first year math student and I have a question about uh, that earlier you mentioned that humans uh, unique capability and when compared to other primates to oh. understand cardinality right. and and you compare to that uh, you said that chimpanzees can only understand cardinality by teaching the numbers one by one and can you explain this more specifically right so uh, so say you have a three-year-old they'll first learn the count words, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so forth, mm -hmm. but they have no meaning. It's just the memorized sequence of words, but they'll remember that first. And then they will start to learn what each count word represents. One represents one thing, two represents two things, three represents three things. And for the each of the one, two, three, maybe even four, they have to learn each of those separately you know, as if they're independent things. But then once they get to around four or so, they have the insight saying that, okay, five is next in my list, one, two, three, four, five. So five is one more than four. And six is one more than five. And seven is one more than, than six. And so they have that insight. You don't have to teach them five means five things or six is six things or seven is seven things. Once they get the concept, they generalize the other words. But for chimpanzee, you have to teach them five, thousands and thousands of trials, and then thousands of more trials to do six. And even if they know the numerals, one, if, even if they know the next numeral is seven, they don't know, they don't have the insight that it's just one more than six that they already know. You have to teach them seven thousands and thousands of trials. So it, it's a very um, uh, pretty amazing insight that, that these little kids have given what our closest relatives um, can't do. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, any other questions? <coughs> Uh, thank you for the enlightening talk. I would like to ask for some implication for early childhood mathematics education. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems to me that ANS would be a prerequisite or whatever for developing the uh, cardinal knowledge or number system knowledge. Okay, mm -hmm. so I wonder whether we should, you know, nurture ANS uh, much more than, you know, doing all the mathematics education in Hong Kong, or whether 
Actually, in Hong Kong, the practice is that we teach numbers at a very early age, okay, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five, and also doing counting and simple addition, uh, subtraction at, uh, in kindergarten, okay. Mm -hmm. Will it be possible that actually through those practices, we also nurture the development of ANS? We don't have to go uh, from right. the step of ANS to the uh, development of cardinal knowledge. Right. Uh, right. So the sequence of, you know, for right. uh, early right. childhood education. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. So, so some people are advocating or suggesting that maybe what you want to do for some kids is say the two or whatever before they can learn number words or numerals is to give them tasks that will make the ANS more sensitive, which you can do. It, it's, it's a malleable um, system. You, you can modify it. Um, personally, I don't think that's necessary. Um, I think uh, what's important is learning the numerals and the number words and what they mean and the symbolic arithmetic. And some other analyses that I didn't show you was that kids who have a poor ANS can still learn cardinality, at least one, two, and three, using their OTS. So even if, even if the ANS is not well developed at that age, they still figure out other ways to figure out what these symbols mean. So, so probably it's not important. Focusing on the early symbolic knowledge is what I would recommend, rather than the ANS directly. Okay. Any other questions? If there's no more questions, then we might conclude the Q&A section. Thank you, Professor Gary and Professor Chen again. To express the college's appreciation, we have prepared souvenirs for both the speaker and the moderator. May I call upon Bali, Mark, Bali Mack, College Associate Head and Dean of Students, to present the souvenirs. Professor Mack, please. First, to our distinguished visiting scholar, Professor Gary. Then to Professor Chen Ping Xing, moderator of today's lecture. <laughs> 